So here we are. Um, I'm going to read two verses because it's one Greek sentence. I'm in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, one Greek sentence. Now, it, does, it doesn't show that in the English, but in the Greek, uh, sentence 1 is a semicolon. Uh, if, and we'll see later, I'm going to look at the structure of it in the Greek in a minute. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, actually the same phrase should be used like it was earlier because in the Greek it's the same structure. Notice in the first verse it said, keep seeking. It should be keep setting. Like keep seeking, keep setting. Keep setting your mind, your mind on the things above. Now, we, now we've got a pattern, haven't we? We got a marker. Agreed? We're always looking for Greek markers. And that is two keys, seeking and setting. On things above. Now we're told what we got to set now. Set, keep setting your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Maybe you're, maybe yours. I can't. I, I memorized so much of the scriptures early in my years out of the King James Bible. Does this say below? Does it say what? Below. Does it say on earth? Uh, yeah, I know what. Then on earth. In King James? Uh, no. On the earth. King James. Yeah. Verse 2, at the end of verse 2. Oh, on the earth. On the, it says on the earth. Yeah. Yep. Not on the things on the earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, they stayed, they stayed on it. Somewhere or another, I got the concept of below. What? Earthly, yeah, earthly things. Yeah, yeah okay. Thanks. I don't know why I went off like that. Uh, Somewhere or another, I had in the back of my mind, set your minds on things above and not things below. Somewhere I got that in my head. It must just be an uh, Adama idea. Certainly not, not in the scriptures, apparently. So I want, I want to tell you something really interesting about Colossians 3 and 4. Okay? Colossians 3 and 4. Come on, Kenny. And then we're going to have a word of prayer. Let's do Colossians 3 and 4. There you go. Thank you, Kenny. Was there anybody else in the parking lot by any chance? Okay. Okay, good. Don't want to lock the door if we got somebody behind them. <laughs> oh, here's what I was going to tell you. Colossians 3 and 4. I want to show you something really interesting. On, the, on your paper, the second column, Colossians 3 and 4, this is really important because this he sets off chap, chapter 3 and 4 with setting your mind on things above and not things on the earth. And he's going to carry that idea through two chapters. And once you know that, that's really going to be helpful for you. <coughs> what I did is I broke it down into seven areas that... Uh, Paul laid out. He, he says, now you need to apply this principle to these seven areas. And he just listed some that they were having trouble in, in the church of Colossae, right? They're having trouble. So he's writing to correct some problems within that church structure on, on it. And so, look, he, he says one is the Christian way of life. That's the first 11 verses. And then church, then marriage then family, then employees, then employer, and ministry. And um, when, you, when you understand how he laid these two chapters out in the book of Colossians, it's very helpful to understand the two verses I'm just going to teach you because they apply to all of these. In other words, anytime you go into one of these areas, you carry, you carry verses 3, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 with you. That kind of sets these, these things up kind of important to us. 
Now, that's based on having studied the book of Colossians, see? So, let's have a word of prayer. Then we're going to take a look at verses 1 and 2 that becomes very important to Paul in Colossians 3 and 4. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest to think seriously about classroom etiquette. We're going to study the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't do this in carnality. You can't study it. You can't learn it. You can't apply it in carnality. How would I know if there's evidence of carnality like in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? How would I know that? Well, evidence would be personal sin. It could be in categories like mental attitude sins, or it could be in the category of sins of tongue or overt sins. If you're aware of any of this within your life, and you should be by conscience or conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you should confess that in silence before Bible study. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, that's maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you do, then God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And that's a marvelous idea connected to your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. So I give you a moment for those who have traveled by automobile and by those who are on the Internet, we expect the same courtesy of classroom etiquette. And so our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these have come our way both by automobile and internet. I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God within our souls as we look at Colossians 3, 1 and 2 and try to work this out within our life to understand the importance of it. As Paul said, this doctrinal principle is important to almost, in fact, he would say, every area of your life. And he mentioned seven of them in Colossians 3 and 4. We're going to look at this in regard to marriage. We're going to look at a case study next week in the life of Jacob. But tonight, Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the foundational structure of the doctrine that's behind, set in our mind. In fact, he says, keep seeking and setting your minds on things above and not on things of the earth. We're always seeking and setting either on the things of the earth or on the things of the heaven. There's no neutrality in the Christian life, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at four aspects of setting your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. And it's a choice. And you're just like in spirituality, you're either spiritual or carnal. You're either walking by faith or walking by sight. These are absolutes. These are mutual exclusive. You're either, you're either seeking and setting your mind on things of the earth or on things of, above a, a heaven or the divine will of God. And so that's the principle that Paul has laid out here in Colossians. And by the way, do you know what the sister book to Colossians is? Oh, that's a gate question for sure. I heard somebody say it. Who? Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians is the sister book to the book of Colossians. So you, when you're in one or the other, you're going to get additional information from one or the other. And tonight I'm going to be swapping back and forth. Because Ephesians 4 is equivalent to Colossians 3. They just discuss it a little bit differently within their congregation as you often do with doctrine. <clears throat> so we're going to look at this. We're going to look at this contrast. The, this mutual exclusive, and Paul says this is going to apply to every area of your life. And he mentions seven that were bothering, that were affecting the church at Colossae. I'm going to pull this out next week into marriage because we've been discussing this along the way. So I'm going to use it on a marriage concept but, uh, and a real, real case life experience. Um, Point number one, we've divided this, this Greek sentence. Remember, this is one Greek sentence, Colossians 3, 1, and 2. We've divided it in two parts of study called seeking and setting. Now, you'll see why that's important here as we, and so I broke that, I broke that one sentence down in these two ideas. Now, what's, in, what, what's kind of interesting to me, because last night we saw, um, uh, a long series that, that was right on the money in the English. When the writers came along, remember, originally, you didn't have chapters and verses. 
They were epistles. They were letters. What is interesting is how the writer, when the interpreters came along and said, okay, let's, the scholars came along and said, let's set this aside. Let's see how we can do this in chapters, and which is interesting, isn't it? Because they did a really good job. Would do this in, in chapters and verses. Uh, they took liberty sometimes to make a, uh, a half of a sentence a verse. And they do it a lot because they felt, I guess, I'm just assuming I wasn't there. I'm just assuming that they thought that the idea here is a completed idea. There's a, there's a thought here that should be separated even though they're part of the same. I don't know why they did that because we're smart enough to figure that out once we keep a complete thought. But this is the reason I don't like that is because this is one completed thought. We shouldn't split it up and make it look like it's two thoughts. Come on now. See, they made it look like, and I don't, I don't know their argument for that, so I can't possibly, I'm not being critical of it. I'm just saying that as a person who pays attention to Greek language, I wish they hadn't done that. <laughs> because this is not two thoughts. It's one thoughts with two great ideas. And, and, so, and so here they are in uh, the seeking part and the setting part. In the seeking part, which is in verse 1, and I believe this is probably why they did it. It just makes sense to me, but uh, why they put it, at, I put it as a semicolon, but they put it as a period. Therefore, if, which is a first-class condition, it means if this true, then the then part, that's, you know, this is the protasis. If, if this is true, then the apotesis is true. Then the if part of it is true. So here it is. It's a, and I put the little if and, and then. I put the then in there so you wouldn't miss that. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. Now, here's what raised up with Christ is. And we'll put the gospel on the board. Christ dies for our sin. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. Third day, that's the gospel. That's, that's uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 16 says, This gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. Now, the point I want to make here is what does it mean when it says, if then you have been raised up with Christ. We call that, here's where Christ is, right? He's in heaven. There's where Christ is. And when we believe the gospel, we are raised up into Christ. We call that current positional truth. That's because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation baptizes us into union with Christ and we become a new creation. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We become a new creation. This is, this is Galatians 3.27. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into union with Christ. We call that positional truth. That's why you cannot lose your salvation because you're in Christ. At the moment you believe he, the gospel, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That's positional truth. You can never lose positional truth. That, that's where your salvation, the salvation that was here is now here. That's your security. That's a powerful idea. And that's how Paul started this thing out. <laughs> he started out, if then, if this is true, if this is true, and it is, if you believe the gospel, you are baptized, because we live under the new covenant, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. If you're into Christ, you see, that's where he starts. If this is true, see, this is the if part. If that's true, if part A is true, then part B is true. That's a first class condition in the Greek. So here's what he says. If you have been raised up with Christ, and you have been if you believe the gospel. It's not something you do. You didn't get saved. You don't get, this is all part of the program of one of 50 things. And if, that's point A, 
part A, then here's what he says. If this is true, now he speaks to you personally. He speaks to you personally as a church age believer. Now he speaks to you personally. Well, he did it up here with you. And he came back to the you. Because that's what he's after. If this is true, if that's true for your life, then this is true for your life. But he made this volitional. Because believing is volitional. How did you, how did you get saved? How did you get into Christ? I believe the gospel is volitional. I chose to believe it. I believe. So he comes back to that premise. He comes back to that premise. This is important now. He comes back to this premise and he puts it in a command. He puts you under a command. He puts seeking. I put it on your paper. It's a present active imperative second person plural. This is true for all of us. If this is true for you, it's true for everybody who believes the gospel. It's not just for some. It's for everyone who believes the gospel. If that's true, then let's take a look at a protasis for your life. Uh, we've looked at the protasis. Now we're going to look at the apotasis for your life. Present active imperative. The imperative makes that a volitional issue, right? <laughs> you got kids, haven't you? All right, I mean, you don't have to, I don't even have to talk any more than that if you had kids. Everybody's had kids know this. Then keep seeking, zateo, present, present tense is continuous action, active voice is volition, imperative is command. Second person plural includes everybody who is in the if, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're in position in Christ, you've been raised up with Christ. Now, but, but listen, that's where, that's where you are positionally, but here's where you are experientially. You're still down here on earth. So he can command you something. I mean, we're boots on the field. He's, he's now issued a command to boots on the field. You understand that term? We're not in the stands. We're on the field. We're playing ball. Uh, boots on the field is because of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, put on the full armor of God and go to combat. That's why that's it. Now, so here's a command, keep seeking. Why is the word keep there? Because it's a present tense. Continuously do this. And it's your responsibility to keep your boots on and stay in the warfare. You stay in the warfare until your mission is completed. Your mission is not completed any different than his. You're going to have to die to complete it. You understand? You walk this out to the end. That dying grace. Now, troops, one thing we have to do is not go AWOL. <laughs> That's my biggest concern as commander in chief here. Uh, I guess I'm not commander in chief. I just got carried away there a minute. <laughs> what a wonderful thing today to have three people be returned from North Korea. Whew -ah. See what fake media does with that kind of news. I'll tell you, a lot of people, including me, will be up tonight to watch that deal. I'll sleep in the morning. I want to see this. Sleep in the morning. I have no idea. Better stay on Fox, so that'd be that's what I'd recommend. Stay on Fox if you want to see it. And, uh, the commentators drive me nuts on the other channel, so I couldn't watch it anyhow. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Therefore, what, 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 where, where are we connected with things above? Have we, have we we've been raised up? So when we're talking about down here, setting your mind, uh, seeking, seeking the things that are above, 
where, where, where are you above? Right? You're in Christ. So what do you think these, what do you think these things are? They're the teachings of Christ, right? We live in the church age. These are the church, these are categorical Bible doctrine of the church age. We live in the church age. This is a church age because of Acts 20, 28, Christ died for the church. He shed his blood for the church. We is the church. We is the church. And so when, when you're down here and he's, he commands you to keep seeking the things above, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the teachings of Christ. Put on the full armor of God. Keep your boots on. Sleep with your boots on. Sleep with your weapon on your bedside. One of the first things in the military they teach you. You, you betcha. Every night. That was his wife. I understand that, but it's up in there. Uh, we never had to, I never had to sleep with a weapon, but I've seen guys do it, and that's because they messed up with a weapon. I never did, but what were you in? Uh, Army? Okay, I was too. What year? Oh, that don't matter. Let's not go there. Uh, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, then keep seeking the things above. Listen, to that. then he tells you, right? What's it say? What's it say? See, I went ahead of you just in case you were going to push back on me. What, what's the next part? Where Christ is. Okay. I could hear you. I could just see somebody pushing back on you. Where does he get that? So I thought I'd beat you. And I'd show, but there it is. Oh. Where Christ is, see at the right hand of God the Father. Now, listen, that process, here you are. You're saved. You're in Christ. When you make that connection with him through the word of God, when you make that reality in your life, that's new man, divine viewpoint thinking. That's what that is. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. I live for Christ. Every day I live for Christ is what Paul says. I live for Christ. Every day I live for Christ. Every day I live for Christ. So he says, what is the word here? Seeking. Seeking. Every day seeking that categorical Bible doctrine connect with the church age that makes my life relevant to my generation. Oh, it's so important to be. Listen, I've gone through a few of these generations. And you know, you know, the message never changes, even though the generation does. You know, they, they keep naming every generation by something, the other name. But, you know, the church, that doesn't make a difference to us. We go out there and tell them the same thing because it works in every generation, in every civilization, in every nation of the world. Go out and tell them the truth. You don't have to match your word to fit their generation. You fit their generation to the word. I'm so happy for that. That's what happened in my life. And what happened in my life, I... Nobody came and molded the word of God around my goofiness. They said, step out of there, son, and join the real human race. Because you're not in the real human race yet. Boy, was that ever true. <laughs> well, and then, so seeking. See that word seeking? Always seeking. You know what that is? Listen, seeking is always learning daily. It's daily inhale, exhale of the word of God, daily. Daily, inhale, exhale, daily, inhale, exhale. Some days, some days, your life, you, you drive all the way, herbal, er, er, herba, uh, er, 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 er. I, I mentioned all the cousins in case you didn't know them. He drove all the way uh, 12 of how many hours? 12 up and 12 back. Nine up, nine back. All right, who's counting? Now, you know what he's doing? He drove all over, dropped the guy off. And then, brought, but now, there's somebody who really loves Uber. Yeah. Well, now, there's a, there's a day that's 
right? Exhale. Unless he's got earplugs coming home. I mean, you know, not earplugs, but um, <laughs> head he headphones. Unless he's got that and listen, listening tapes. Well, it's all, it's all exhale. It's, it's talking on the way up and praying on the way back. Well, he's talking about Jesus. I promise, I promise you, I got that. There's a guy seeking. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the seeking part. You know, always, always inhale, exhale of 2 Timothy 3.16. Always inhale, exhale. Some days it's, it's, heavy, it's heavy inhale and some days it's heavy exhale. And sometimes you got a natural life. You know, a little bit of both. And, and it's all good in it. It's all good. You know, sometimes you're sitting in an emergency room or sometimes you're on the emergency table. And it's, uh, and it's exhale. And uh, that, that's what we're talking about here in the seeking part. What are we seeking? We're seeking our relationship with Christ to be reality to our generation. And then he says setting. He says keep setting. Notice this, why it should be keep setting is because it too is a present active imperative. Do you see that? There's, there's two present active imperatives, which means continuous action. I want you to, I want you to keep seeking. And I want you to keep what? Setting. I want you to keep seeking. See, you got to seek in order to set. You see? You, got, you keep taking inhale, inhale, inhale. See, that's one thing. And, and, you, and you begin to grow. You, you grow in knowledge. The other part of this is the exhale is where you actually see that thing work and you go like, oh, God answers prayer. Oh, God is faithful. Oh, God provides. You know, that's the reality of all the stuff we've learned. Oh, I shared the gospel. They got saved. Woo! I remember the first time I did that, I was like, it worked. <laughs> I mean, who knew? I mean, who knew? It, it worked. And so... See, that's part of inhale, exhale. When I inhaled, I got saved, but I didn't know. When I exhaled that information out and somebody else got saved, I went, whoa. I believe I got a hold of something here. <laughs> yeah? Uh oh Then when I actually got a member of my family to do it, I went, lights out. <laughs> this is, no, my family would have never, they never followed anything I said. <laughs> How smart they were. <laughs> so I know something different had happened. Keep setting your what? Your clock. Uh, your husband, your wife, your kids. Right? Your work. Keep setting your what? Mine. Uh, mine's only, mine is only over matter when it matters that it's connected with Christ. Mind over matter is just another futile chase. That's willpower, and willpower gets you more trouble than any power in the world. At least that was true in my life. <laughs> One time, I was a sophomore, and I didn't do something that, by command of my mother, I thought could wait. Something like clean your, make your bed before you go to school. I mean, that I mean, it was something tr trite in my world. Trite in my world. <clears throat> I didn't do it. And I, I had uh, big plans. And I come home, my mother says, she could see me, you know, going to the shower. That's early. Doing this. Oh. Said, what you got up tonight, boy? I said, oh, I've got... Uh, uh, uh. She said, not tonight, you don't. Because the general went and expected my barracks before I left. <laughs> oh, it didn't matter that I was running late to catch the bus. Mm -mm. Should have got up a little bit earlier. And so I had a few things to say. My mother let me say it. And she said, that will be two weeks. I responded. And we went up to about six weeks. And it dawned on me, my mother never fudged on any discipline ever in my life. And I was at six weeks, and I thought, stupid. Hey, stupid, come over here a minute. That inner dialogue. 
And do you know what? My mother never recanted, and I'm so thankful this day, this day for that. She held my feet to the fire. Do you know how long six weeks is to a sophomore who can now drive? I mean, I was like 21 when I got out of jail. <laughs> what a lesson I learned. It's a wonderful lesson, I can tell you. It wasn't then, though. All right? Keep setting your mind. And this, this word for now means to think in a certain way. And, and we know where we're, what, what, this is the Christ way. Set my mind. That we always set our minds. It's either on below or below. It's either on the earth or in heaven, right? It's either on things of this earth or the things of Christ. Keep setting your mind. That thinking in a certain way, that is the Christ way. He's going to talk about this in verse 10 and 11 anyhow, but that's new, that's new man, divine viewpoint thinking, people. Think on, think, setting your mind on things above is the things of Christ, not on the things of the earth. And I gave you, pass, I gave you scriptures right out of that. The present imperatives, two, these two present imperatives of keep seeking and keep setting, bring us to a commitment because they're imperatives. Bring us to a commitment to consistent spiritual growth maturity. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, always that. Listen, these are dynamics. You can walk in the spirit or you can walk in the flesh. You can't walk in both. You can walk by faith, you can walk in sight, but you can't walk by both. You understand? You can walk in the ways of Christ, you can walk in the ways of the world. But you can't, can't do them both. And it's a commitment you make. Uh, the imperative is a commitment you make. It's a commitment you make. And I'm telling you, people, what I'm telling you today is really good because Paul says, if you understand what I'm going to teach, you can put it in any area of your life. I don't care what it is, and I don't care what's going on. Do you hear me? That's the reason I laid out chapters 3 and 4 for you. That's what he did. The present imperatives are a commitment. And listen, because it's the present tense, listen to me now, it's a commitment of a daily choice you have to make. Every day you have to choose, will I walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh? Will I walk by faith or will I walk by sight? Will I walk in the mindset of Jesus Christ or will I walk in the mindset of the world? Every day. Every day. Every day. You can't set it, can't set it for the week. You know, your alarm clock, if you go to work, you set it for a certain time. You get up every day, go to work. This thing, mm -mm, it's already, you got to make a commitment. This is how you walk. This is the way you walk it out in this world. It's a daily choice, positive or negative. I, I love 2 Corinthians 4.16 because it said, listen, I don't care if you're aging. It's still the daily renewal that's important, right? It's that inner man that's being renewed daily. The outer man, pay, you know, you look at it and go, what you ought to say is, listen, I've had a good life. When I look in the mirror, I don't look at my age. I look at my good life. I've had a wonderful, wonderful life. But I'll tell you, I didn't until I met Christ. I was, an, I was a stormtrooper. <laughs> Yet it took a mother like I had to keep me in line. And I tried to smooth her every way it could be, and she held, my mother always held to it. I knew it. My mother, when I was a little boy, convinced me, listen, God, I, I, she'd say, I'm going to spank you. And I said, well, you have to catch me. And she never ran. She said, well, I'll tell you how it works, son. Here's how it works, Ronnie. I'll get you tonight when you're asleep. I come on back because my mother would have got me that night while I was asleep. I didn't know how she'd get me, so I thought I'd go ahead and take it while I had my eyes open. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that woman. Now, she'd go to prison today. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah they'd throw my mother in jail today and let me become a hellion. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but I'm not one. 
the present imperatives of keeping and seeking are continuous commitments of a daily choice. It is seeking of the knowledge of the directive will of God coming down from the commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. The setting of one's own will, taking the directive will of God over your own will is where new, van, new man divine viewpoint thinking is. Every day, buddy. Every day. You know what? Devil gets up early. I don't know that he ever sleeps, tell you the truth. He ain't got any time to sleep because he knows where he's headed. Point number two. In Ephesians, I want you to go to Ephesians a moment. I taught this up at the ladies' conference. I taught some of it. I was really leery of doing this, but God wouldn't. I wrote three different lessons, and he made me come back to it, so I, I stayed with it. In Ephesians 4, through 24, Paul explains, and this is really important, the mechanics of setting your mind on things above. Now, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're seeking in the imperative and when you're setting in the imperative, that's, that's new man divine viewpoint thinking. And Colossians and Ephesians both talk about new man and old man. And he's talking to Christians like he is here. Paul uses three infinitives to teach the mechanics in reference to your former manner of life. Look at verse 22. He says, in reference to your former manner of life. See verse 2. Are you in Ephesians? Yeah. All right. Ephesians 4.22, that in reference to your former manner of life. Now, notice three imperatives, and I laid it out because this is where the whole message is. This is what people miss, not paying attention. Lay aside, that's an aorist middle infinitive. The aorist is a point in time. Whenever this problem comes up, this is how you have to deal with it. Old man. Whenever, whenever the old man comes up and you have to deal with it, this is how you deal with it. All right, lay aside what? The old man, he's talking to Christians, which, which, and that's very important. I can't tell you how important that little word which is. Which. Which is being corrupted. That's a destructive mechanism, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. That CD by that is Cosmos Diabolicus. Who's in charge of the lust of deceit? Who is the great deceiver of the world that would attack Christians? It's Satan. Ephesians 4.27 tells you, do not give the devil an opportunity or a foothold in your life. Don't let him stick his toe in the door where you can't shut it. You just pull the door back like my mother would and said, I would suggest you move your foot or you'll go to the emergency room. <laughs> Boom. All right? So he's always got his toe in your door. He needs to understand that you'll break that big toe off. If I have to, I'll go get a saw. Get your toe out of my door. But it's your volitional choice. Give him no opportunity in your life Give him none. That's Ephesians 4.27. And then in 2 Corinthians 11.3, we have a case study. It's Eve. What got Eve? And she even says it. She gives her testimony to it. The devil. Now, he doesn't make you do it. <laughs> the devil made me do it, you know. Remember that? It used to be back in the 70s. You remember he had this? What? Yeah. The devil made me do it. Remember that? Devil made me. But, but the, there is a truth in that. But he doesn't make you do it. Right? It's a choice you make. But, but that's cosmos diabolicus. That's cosmos. So here's, here's an old man. How do you? Here's old man. What's that? That's the way you're thinking according to your former way of life. You've got some habits, some patterns in there that disrupt the will of God working in your life. Well, when it does disrupt the working in there, then what you've got is cosmos diabolic. He's got you working on his program as a, as a, as a believer. 
And we call that, now you see the connection? Listen, here, everybody has an old man because you have a former way of life. <laughs> okay? Where does, what, how does cosmos diabolicus get attached to that? You understand that? It's called the lust of deceit. Okay? That's buying into his program. See, he runs the earthly program. Jesus runs the heavenly program. Jesus is trying to get the heavenly program down to earth because that's where victory is. And a believer has an old man. He has it after salvation just as he has it before salvation. Okay? But it doesn't, you, when, you can always tell when cosmos diabolic is attached to it because it's called the lust of deceit. Now, in a Christian's life, the unbeliever doesn't know it. It's not an issue because he's lost his Hogan's goat. But for you and I, this is a whole new awakening now because we live in the light, not darkness. And this is bringing darkness into light. You understand that? The lust of deceit, that's bringing darkness into light. <laughs> then in verse 23, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Notice, notice something. That's a present passive infinitive. I'm going to hold that. I want to go to, I want to, go to the next point. Here's verse 24. Put on. He's talking to Christians. Put on the new man, and there's another witch. See, these witches are important. Here's the old man. Watch out. You got an old man. You still have an old man. You're going to have it because it's part of your flesh. You're going to have it till you die. Okay? What you've got to be aware of is cosmos diabolicus. It's the enemy. He uses, he touches your old man just like he touches the flesh, the sin nature, he, he, temptation. This is what he's working. He's working on, uh, what, 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 he's, he's working your mind. You see, what, what, what's he after? Your mind. What is the Lord after? Your mind. He's after your mind. So be careful that you don't get hooked up into cosmos diabolical thinking because that's how you get it attached to old man. Now, how you detach him and how you beat the old man is put off. Put, put off, lay aside, put off the old man, put off the cosmic system. Now, you can't put off the old man in the sense of getting rid of it, but you're putting off the way, of, way he's thinking, especially when it gets into cosmos diabolicus, because you're in a danger zone. You're in a danger zone. Oh, jeez. Matthew, this famous passage of Matthew 16, 21 through 23, is Peter. Listen to me. Here's Peter, right? Top disciple, top disciple, has been with Jesus right from the start. Right? Top disciple. What are the three pillars of the church? Here he is. Jesus has been in heavy discussions about him going to the cross. It's time for him. It's now deadline. The deadline has come that the mission be completed. All the training's over. Now we're on a mission. And so he's preparing his disciples for the mission. He says to them, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be convicted as an enemy of the state. They're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. They're going to bury me. And on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. Peter says, enough of that foolishness. Enough of it. You have no idea how depressing you've got the disciples. They are beside themselves. You've got to quit talking this morbid way. We are looking for a kingdom and a king to come. Kingdom come. So, Jesus says to him, one of those tags you're going to miss if you don't pay attention. Get behind me. You've become a stumbling block to me on my mission. And it's a mission you should be with me on. This is not a mission alone. That's why I picked all of you. I'm the only one that's going to die, but the rest of you have to stay with the mission with you. How many male disciples showed up at the mission? How many? 
one. John. You know the rest of them? Women. God bless you women. One guy. And did you know that he had an appointment? Listen, just think. Jesus spoke a mission right into his heart, didn't he, from the cross? Oh, yes. That's a Mother's Day. Gave him the mother. Listen, just think if the other 11 been there, what Jesus might have said to them. I mean, where you are and what you do is important, people. You need to be on top of your game all the time. That's why it's daily. That's why it's in the imperative present tense of seeking and setting. Because every day you have this opportunity to be in the right place at the right time for God to teach you something so gigantic you wouldn't want to ever miss it. Eleven disciples missed an enormous blessing by not being there. He had called them to fo follow the mission. One guy showed up. And boy, did he get rewarded. Did he ever get rewarded? It is John that should have been the first pope. Should have been John. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a pope, <laughs> should have been John. Shouldn't have been Peter. Should have been John. He was the guy that took Mary home and took care of her. Just saying. You know, if you're gonna stay true to the scripture, stay true to him. Put on the new man, which, notice this, which, in the likeness of God. So we're showing how new man's going to, what connects to new man? Watch this now. New man in the likeness of God has been created, watch this now, in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And there is divine viewpoint. It is when divine viewpoint gets created through righteousness and holiness in the life of a believer through the divine truth that the new man born again at the cross is able to put on divine viewpoint thinking. See those two important witches? Now, how does that work? Here's how it works. I'm told to take off old man, cosmos diabolicus, right? The, the old man which is, right? The old man, which is, you know, the witch. Okay. You got to take it off and you got to put, you got to set aside the old man. You got to take the old man. You got to take the cosmic, cosmic, C, the CD, the cosmic diet. You got to take it off, the old man, right? You got to put on the divine viewpoint thinking on the new man. And you do that by the renewing of your mind. I want to show you something now. See the taking off? Eris tense. See the putting on? Eris tense. That's a point in time when it's needed, right? When it's in conflict with the, with the will of God, when it's in conflict. Look down at new man. It's an eris tense. When you've got, listen, when you've got to take off something, you've got to put on something. And listen, it's a pattern. Look, here, look. here you are, carnal. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but carnal. You're carnal because you're walking in the flesh. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill desires of the flesh, which we studied in James 1, 14 and 15, which is personal sin. That's how you know it. That's how the results is. You, you confess your sin to get out of carnality just to get back to the Holy Spirit. The point is you should have walked in the spirit. And you would not got in that mess. Hello? That's divine viewpoint. So if I'm carnal, I haven't committed a sin, I confess it. Here's what he wants you to learn to do. Unplug and plug up. Before you ever get to the sin part, that's, listen, that's taking care of the sin. It's not taking care of the source. Confession of sin takes care of the sin. It doesn't take care of the source. He wants you to take care of the source. The source was a sin nature, lust that you gave into, gratified, and turned into personal sin. Agreed? So the next time I'm tempted, right, what do I do? I, listen, I, I, 
I get into my head, I get straight into the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If I get carried away and enticed, I, ha I now I'm in danger zone, the red flag's up. I've got to really get up tight with the Holy Spirit, do you understand? Because I'm in a danger zone now, I've really got to be on the alert, right? I must never conceive because if I conceive, then I give birth to sin and sin gives birth to death. So I've got to learn. Listen, confession of sin is a wonderful thing because it brings me back to where I, fall, where I fell out of. But listen, I've got to learn to stay in the boat. I've got to learn to stay in the boat. Stop falling over all the time. <laughs> I've got to stay in the boat. You've got to stay in the boat. That's just, this is, and the same thing is I got to walk by faith, not by sight. I got to walk by, listen, these are all imperatives. Walk in the spirit, imperative. Walk by faith, imperative. Here, imperative, imperative, imperative. These are imperative to your life. They're imperative to your life. You're never going to reach spiritual maturity. You're never going to find out all this creative, powerful, wonderful stuff that's God created for your life. You're going to go through this whole life and, and you're just blindfolded. You're blindfolded. You can't do that. You've got to, you've got to learn. To, you've got to be consistent to make the good choices. Make good choices. Make good choices. We tell it to our kids and then deny it in our own self. Put on. Put on. Be renewed. Where? Watch this now. Where's the warfare? Where's he, what's he tell you to restore? What's he tell you to renew? In the spirit of the mind. In the spirit of the not mind. See, that's what Paul said in Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 14, when he says, make no provisions for the flesh. That word provision is the word forethought. Pronoia. Listen, look at the bottom of your paper. Your mind can be a mind field, M-I-N-E, or a ministry field. Your mind. And listen, the devil knows this if you don't. Let me tell you, he toys and plays with your mind all the time. You got to learn how to beat him. You got to learn how to beat him. You walk in the power of the spirit, not in the flesh. You walk by faith, not by sight. You walk, right? You walk by, by seeking and setting your mind, your mind on things above, not things here. That's how you beat it. You know, let your mind get you in trouble. It's a minefield. Turn it into a ministry field. Now, three questions. Now I have to close. I'm not going to get the rest of this. Aren't you happy? I can't get the rest of this. I want to close with three questions. And the rest of this you can study on your own. Did you notice that Cosmos Diabolicus, the CD, is attached to old man? By the lust of deceit. Did you notice that? And when it happens, it forms old man cosmos diabolic thinking. Number two. Did you notice that divine viewpoint is attached to new man by righteous and holiness of the truth? Divine viewpoint. Did you know that? Yeah, now I do. Thank you. <coughs> Ephesians 4.24. John 8.32. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. From what? Cosmic system. John 14.6. Jesus said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. Listen, you want all three of them. That's why you seek him right here. You seek him and you set your mind on it. He's the truth. I want the truth. He said, well, you got it. Study the New Testament. Study the doctrines of the church age, right? Put everything else in their proper order. Look at three. Did you notice that the mechanics of the exchange from old man cosmos diabolicus to new man divine viewpoint thinking is by the renewing of the spirit of your mind? Now, how do you renew the spirit of your mind? That's point number three. Most of you are familiar with that. It's called the faith cycle. The key for you, though, 
is not just to learn it, to be consistent with living it. See, you come to this church, it's not about learning alone. It's learning to live it. Learning to live it. And listen, listen to me. It takes a while to get it. I know we overwhelm you with information. I know that. Listen, you'll get this. This will all make sense to you in its time. It will come together in your soul. Be patient. Because when it does come, the light will go off on, in you, and it will be the most exciting thing you've ever experienced in your life, bar none. Then point four, seeking and setting your mind on New man, divine viewpoint thinking is called transformation. This whole business right here, this exchange right here, uh, seeking and setting that whole principle on a daily deal, when that starts to work in your life on a daily deal and not once in a while, not, not until you just fall in a mud hole and can't get out, when that starts working under all conditions, good condition, bad condition, whatever, when that starts working, then you've got what's going on. It's called transformation. Because the word itself is made up of two Greek words, which means to change the form of something. It means to change the form. It means breaking old patterns of thinking and behaving and replacing them with new ones. That's an exchange of old man cosmos. Die. The old pattern is in conflict with the things that you've learned that God wants you to do. That's how you know it's cosmos diabolicus. And divine viewpoint is when it operates, you know it's there because now you've overcome bad habits, bad, bad everything in your life, and you're, you're okay about it. I mean, gosh, I can't believe it. When did, I, when did that thing actually happen? We well, just grew into a whole complete changeover. It's not like lightning. It's a processing. And it's a magnificent process. It's a magnificent process. When you can see yourself, when you can see the transformation working in your own life of breaking bad habits and old habits and patterns in your life, when you can begin to see them break loose and dissolve in your life and you just have this better attitude and everything, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing experience. It's an amazing experience. To be calm in the midst of a storm and just believe it's okay. Rather than panicking and falling apart. And it's, it's, it's just there's something in your soul that just goes like it's okay. I mean God's got, God's got a hold of every bit of this. Just walk it out. Do not be conformed to the world but be transformed. Romans 12 2. He's talking about. Be don't be conformed to this world. That's old man cosmos diabolical. Be transformed. That's new man divine viewpoint thinking. Well, how? He says, by the renewing of your what? Mind. Is this brain surgery? Well, in some ways, isn't it? Brain surgery. All right. Well, I've gone as far as I can go tonight. Thank you. And next week, I'm going to take a case study out of Jacob's life in marriage. And we're going we're gonna to walk this principle out in his life so that you can see the dynamics of it. And listen, you'll see how tough sometimes it is to take off the old and put on the new. And sometimes you're not willing to do it. And then you're going to pay consequences for it. You're not willing to do it. So we're going to study that next week. So. Be sure to come back next week and especially those who are visiting with us by the internet, come back next week and I'll show you how this works out in a case study out of the word of God. Father, we're th thankful for these that have come our way tonight by automobile and internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson. It will take some study. Uh, William says about 10 times, you study this thing about, hear it about 10 times, somewhere around there and it starts to click. I do understand that. Gosh, I don't know how many times I've heard it. Um, what I hear today is not so much the principles that I've heard over and over. What I hear is the importance of doing this consistently daily, making right choices.
that's where I am today. It's not on the learning curve. It's on the living curve. And uh, I'm thankful for that growth period that moved me from there. But we have others that are in the learning curve, and I pray for that. Um, many who have dropped in and visiting with us, we pray for that. Uh, if you're in the Birmingham area, we would encourage you to come and be with us in our class studies. Uh, I know it's more convenient for you to sit and do, do other things, but we would love to have you come and be part of the dynamics of forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and see the dynamics of friendships of people who are in the same page of mindset with the Lord. And we would encourage that just for Bible study with us on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and of course on Sundays. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.